basically, Sarah and I were talking about the June schedule and what sort of um, Lackawanna pastimes we wanted to talk about. And then we realized that the first Friday in June was also NEPA Gives Day. So I thought, well, let's talk about the Historical Society and let's kind of go back in time and talk about how it started and what sort of activities we do and uh, then and now. And um, we thought that way we could get you excited and maybe when we're done here, you'll all go to nepagives.org and donate something to the Historical Society. So uh, that's our motive today. Um, but as we started to look at the Historical Society's history, we realized there's a, a lot uh, of organizational stories and, and legends and things that happened that would be fun to revisit and talk about. Um, so I said to Sarah, we could call it Marianne and Sarah Tell All, and she said, or Our Dirty Little Secrets. <laughs> so that's how the name came up. Sarah was getting very excited and decided we would un unleash some of the historical society's more legendary stories. So I hope we do that today. Um, it is 134 year history. So I will be honest, I left a lot out but we can always come back and uh, pick up another decade or two and talk about some of our other favorite stories and characters who have been involved with the Historical Society. Um, so to do this, uh, Sarah and I created a joint PowerPoint. So I'll ask Sarah to share her screen so we can see some images as we go back to the beginning. So as I said, we're calling it Lackawanna Historical Society Then and Now, or Marianne and Sarah Tell All the Dirty Little Secrets. So uh, <laughs> what we're going to do today is go back in time to where the Historical Society began. And as much as we love our, our Catlin House, that's not where we started. There was no Catlin House when the Historical Society was founded. We're going back even before 1912 when the house was built. So if we look at the next slide, we'll see where everything really began for the Lackawanna Historical Society. The Lackawanna Historical Society was founded eight years after Lackawanna County was incorporated. And uh, to kind of put some imagery into this, we went looking at some newspaper articles and found some great headlines about when Lackawanna County was born. If you know this story, um, you know that up until 1878, Lackawanna County was part of Luzerne County and um, the northern section of Luzerne County is what forms Lackawanna County as you can see on this map or any night when you watch the weather. Um, Luzerne County, anybody living and working in Luzerne County would have to travel to Wilkes-Barre to file any kind of legal documents or anything. So it was really lawyers and, and kind of business leaders who started this movement of what they at one time called a divorce. Lackawanna County wanted to leave, or Northern Luzerne County wanted to leave and form its own county. And it was kind of controversial at the time, but if you look at the article on the lower left corner, which was actually published in the Wilkes-Barre paper, it says everybody was happy when Lackawanna County was founded in August of 1878. Lackawanna was wild over her victory, and Luzerne was jubilant over the separation. I'm not sure exactly why, but everybody was happy. So that's a wonderful thing. Brand new county, we were the 67th and the youngest county formed in the state of Pennsylvania. So then we move ahead eight years. If we look at the next slide, we'll see that some of those same men that I was talking about, the lawyers, the movers and the shakers, they decided that it would be a very important thing to start early to preserve the new county's history. So on November 26, 1885, a notice was placed in the Scranton Republican newspaper inviting the public to come together on the following day, November 27th, and discuss the formation of a natural science and historical association. And even the Carbondale leader got in on this, the newspaper in Carbondale, would later report that the idea was a good one and the result of a well-directed effort in that direction will well repay for the time and effort expanded. So everybody in Northern Luzerne, the brand new Lackawanna County was all for this idea of forming a new institution. And that's what they did. So in the next slide, you'll see some of those movers and shakers that I was talking about. Um, they had three initial meetings in late 1885. And after those three meetings, the Lackawanna Institute of History and Science was born. They elected officers, some of them included Dr. Benjamin Troop, Alfred Hand, Colonel John Price, A.W. Dixon, William Connell. 
And those are some of the men that you see in these photos. There were others. I believe someone named Wheeler was uh, hired as the curator for a short time. He received $50 a month. Um, at some point, he got a little annoyed and he quit his job. Um, and another man named Wilcox, and you see his name in the notices hereby given, um, he was the solicitor and the secretary of the organization in the early years. And if you've ever met one of our members named Rich Jenkins, who descends from the Jenkins Township founders, um, Mr. Wilcox was a member of the Jenkins family. And he had also donated many archives that deal with the very early founding of the Wyoming and Lackawanna Valleys, which are in our collection. And our friend Rich Jenkins has been exploring those as of late. But the Historical Society, Lackawanna Institute of History and Science, was officially incorporated on March 11th, 1886, with a charter and bylaws, and attracted a membership of 465 members. If we go to the next slide, we'll see that in the early years, the organization did flourish. They held their public meetings in the Board of Trade building. We know that today is the Electric City building, but you can see it in the top left corner photo, um, the building with the two uh, turrets or windows with points. Um, they had a membership grow to 500 individuals. And at that time, that was considered to be one of the highest memberships for an organization of this time across the country. So uh, things were really moving and shaking, as I said. Uh, they established a significant collection of books, pamphlets, and specimens, which were placed in rooms they secured at the courthouse. Uh, the deal with the courthouse was that the institute could use the rooms if they paid for the refurbishing of them. So they put some money into that from the membership dues they collected. And then they also continued to meet in the Board of Trade building um, where they would have public lectures um, from speakers, not just local, but speakers from all over the country. Um, one geology class that they offered was a two week course that had field work where people would go out into the Lackawanna Valley to learn about the geology of the area. So they were very serious Institute of History and Science. And what's important to remember, in 1886, this was one of the only cultural institutions in Lackawanna County in the city of Scranton. We did not have an Everhart Museum yet. We did not have the public library yet. So we were kind of handling everything at this point. And I think that's why there was so much enthusiasm wrapped around it and why people were joining and signing on to participate. So um, those 1880s, the very beginning, it was a very successful and prosperous time for what became the Lackawanna Historical Society. Next slide. Okay, so the group's first president I mentioned in an earlier photo was John Price, Colonel Price. He died in 1892, and after his death, the, the organization found itself starting to struggle a bit more. Their membership numbers declined. They had to give up the rooms at the courthouse. They had to move all of their collections into storage space at the Green Ridge and Albright Library. So by this time in the 1890s, we do have these libraries, but we just, the Historical Society, or what would become the Historical Society, had to put their collections into storage because they didn't have um, the leadership and the people involved that they started with. Um, then you had Frederick Platt as president for a short time and Edward Merrifield. Edward Merrifield and um, Mr. Platt really tried to resurrect the organization so that by 1914, they decided to reorganize. They made Mr. Merrifield president and they moved the collections into the Everhart Museum so that they could put them all in one place and they also started to try to have public programs again. The other thing they did was to work again with the state and some other organizations around the country to start a marker program, to start marking things of historical significance around the county. And you see in the corner, the pothole marker was placed on Saturday in 1920. If we go to the next slide, I want to just mention the pothole a little bit more. Um, the Archibald Pothole is a site that has a long history with Lackawanna Historical Society. As early as 1887, when we started, we were offering tours of the pothole. We would bring groups up, sometimes on the, the DNH train, people would run up, um, but they would go up and they would talk to geologists again and they would learn a little bit more about what was considered to be a scientific wonder of the world. Um, at this time, it was the largest pothole that we knew of in the world. Now, since then, 
Luzerne, Switzerland has taken first place and the Archibald pothole is considered to be the second largest, but it's still there. Um, the Historical Society officially received ownership of it in 1917. We have the deed in our collection. It was deeded to us by uh, Mrs. Frances Hackley. Her husband, who had passed away by then, owned the mining company that owned the property where the pothole was discovered. In 1940, the society would turn the deed over to Lackawanna County, and then in 1961, the state would take ownership. I think the state still owns it today, but there was a movement about 10 years ago where I think Archibald and even German boroughs were trying to, to take some ownership to, to refurbish a bit. Um, but under the historical society's ownership, we worked really hard to try to make it more accessible and to promote visits to it. And I love the quote in the Scranton Times article from March 9th, 1921, where they talk about the good work the historical society is doing, but they also point out that many persons do not know of the existence of a historical society in our county. The Lackawanna Institute of History and Science dates back to the founders of our our city and writing the history, we have Colonel Frederick Hitchcock and J.C. Platt involved and both go back very early in the history, not just of Scranton, but of Lackawanna County and the Valley. Um, I think it's interesting that even back in 1921, we were considered Scranton's best kept secret because that's a battle that continues today. Many times people might walk in the front door of the Catlin house and say, huh, I never knew this place was here. So um, it's kind of interesting to know that that struggle has been going on for a very long time. Um, but people like Hitchcock and other prominent citizens got more involved after 1914 with the reorganization under Merrifield. And by 1918, Colonel Hitchcock was president of the organization. He served until 1924. And then L.A. Watrous was elected. And he served until 1937. Now, the success and activity of these men um, is really due to the gentleman that you see in this slide. Thank you, Sarah. This is Fletcher Wayburn. He served as secretary under both men, under Hitchcock, and you see his lovely portrait there in the corner. Um, I couldn't find a quick slide of L.A. Watchers, but I did find him in this lovely Historical Society annual dinner sketches by Stanky, who did a lot of cartoons for the newspaper back in the day. So it's a little later, but you could see that uh, Colonel Watchers, circled in blue, was the Toastmaster for our annual dinner. And Fletcher Wayburn, circled in red, is not far behind. Fletcher Wayburn really helped revive the Historical Society in the late teens and 1920s. His work improved the situation by scheduling more public programs, presenting local speakers, making the library more accessible, and establishing what he called the lifetime membership. The first lifetime membership, under Wayburn's suggestion, was presented to a gentleman named George Henry Catlin. Next slide. So George Catlin was involved with the Historical Society from very early on. He was born in Vermont, but came to Scranton in the 1870s for business and personal interests. He um, married Mary Archibald, who was the daughter of James, who was the mayor of Carbondale. He founded the Third National Bank of Scranton. So um, he did very well in the, the community and supported the Historical Society when it was founded in the 1880s. Um, but then by the early 1900s, his situation changed a little bit. Um, his wife, Mary, died in 1902, and he married Helen Catlin. And when we talk about dirty little secrets, Helen might be one of our favorites. Um, as you can see, love always finds a way. George married, they call her Ellen in the newspaper, but her name was... Helen, um, and it causes interesting gossip. The reason it causes gossip, even to this day, is because she was a housekeeper at his home that he lived at with his first wife. So he basically married the maid, um, and much to the benefit of the Lackawanna Historical Society, did not have children from either marriage, but built a beautiful house after he traveled around the world for his honeymoon with his second wife in 1912 built the Catlin House. And that house would become the permanent headquarters of the Historical Society. George died in 1935. 
Helen lived there until her death in 1942, and the Historical Society moved in, as you could see with the wonderful photo of our first board meeting on June 14, 1942, in the dining room of the Catlin House. I wish we still had that wallpaper. It's wild. Um, but we certainly still have the portrait of George Catlin. Little commercial, if you haven't been on our website to visit our ghostly gallery, please do. You'll go and you'll be able to see George Catlin's portrait talk to you. It's animated and it's a lot of fun. So um, check that out. Now, since we have found our home in 1942 at the Lackawanna Historical Society's Catlin House, we've continued our 134 years of telling the story of Lackawanna County. Um, I want to give Sarah some time to bring us up into the, the current activities, but here are just some examples of what we've done um, since that time, really, I think the earliest slide is the one of the woman in go-go boots. I have not been able to identify her, but she was here probably in the 60s or 70s giving a lecture. The gentleman to her left, um, his name is Paul Atkins Spencer. He was a representative of the Philharmonic, and he was here to speak in 1980. Um, we have been involved in several programs since I started working here in the 90s. We always welcome school groups in. You see a, a school group here at Christmas time in the upper corner um, with Anne Marie O'Hara dressed as a maid. Not any reason, um, but just to greet the, the children for a Christmas tour. Um, City Pride. I don't know if Clem Fassbender joined us today, but I put this in because Clem's been joining us on Zoom from New York. Um, before she moved, she was an active volunteer, and that's her in her Lackawanna Historical Society shirt on the front porch during a Scranton Tomorrow event called City Pride, which is basically a cleanup day at the Catlin House when our volunteers all come together to help us keep our house looking as good as it does. We've done a lot of fun programs. You can see the Titanic dinner on the slide. Um, and our friends John Hart and Alan Sweeney are in this photo. Always good to see them. Um, and then down in the corner, you can see a very young Marianne uh, with my predecessor, Mary Ellen Colimo, and Jack Hiddlestone, who was a caregiver here for many years, and Joe DeCipio. He was the architect who led our church tours for a number of years. We started with an up the line church tour, then we went down the line. We traveled throughout the whole county every year, offering a chance for people to visit places of worship, learn about the architecture, the history of the organization, and we often visited cemeteries along the tour. That's the old cemetery in Taylor on Main Avenue, in case you're wondering. And we continue to have lectures and programs. Um, we change up our exhibits from time to time. Uh, right now we're providing programs like this, but we hope to continue for at least another 134 years. Uh, the photo with the birthday cake was actually a 1986 celebration of our 100th anniversary. And we have some former trustees there, uh, Marie Smith and Oli Collins, I think Kathy Keating, Joe Semini, and Mary Ellen's predecessor, who was Dorothy Silva. She was director of the Historical Society at that time. So if you've been with us for a long time, you might recognize some of these folks. If you're brand new to the organization, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, and maybe you'll see some familiar faces in her slides. <laughs> Yes, these are these are the, the color photos of things that are going on that are going on now, and you you may you definitely may see yourselves in these. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we've we've expanded a little bit from just um, historical programming at the house. Um, we've started doing a lot more in the community, a lot more that's a little more pop culture, uh, maybe a little bit silly, but um, a lot more fun. This would have been actually uh, the 16th year for our Grand Civil War Ball um, that we've held at the at the Century Club um, that draws costumed interpreters and dancers to come to dance to period music. Um, we usually have a contingent of um, Civil War soldiers who join us for that. Uh, we've done Christmas open houses at the Catlin House. We usually try and bring in some kind of special exhibit. Uh, the photo that's in the upper right hand corner is Uta Dreyer uh, with her collection of German Christmas um, decorations and toys. She gave us a lot of really delicate, really delicately done tiny seams and then uh, larger smokers that we would put incense in. Uh, we've done the Hill House tour for a number of years now. Last year we teamed up with the Greenhouse, the Greenhouse Project at NAOG um, and did a, made it a tour of homes and gardens. So we're continuing to expand things. Um, I'm not sure if Lenny was able to, to get back in, um, but Lenny has always been- has I'm been back. Hello! Um, Lenny has been in charge of our walking tours for a number of years, um, our summer walking tours. 
there's a, a photo on the bottom of uh, one of our volunteers, Joyce Satala, doing a, a special tour for a group during a conference. Each summer, we've been having a special day for children at the Catlin House um, with crafts and games and old timey things that they could get involved in. Um, these are kids making, I think, tiny flower pot things um, at the dining room table in the Catlin House. And then we've branched out even more to do evenings at the drive-in with um, retro movies. Um, the photo with the um, camper is a Christmas vacation, but we had a costume contest. It ended up with a fleet of Cousin Eddie's. Um, but it's a, it's a fun time to go outside. Um, again, commercial in two weeks on June 17th, we'll be showing Jaws at the drive-in um, as a benefit for the Historical Society. So if you're in town, head up that evening. Um, we do still do lectures and programs. Um, we've had guest speakers come in. We've done our own programming. Um, as Marianne said, we have changing exhibits in the house. Um, Thomas Jefferson came two years ago to speak on President's Day um, and was astonished how everybody had gotten here on their horses so quickly. Um, he, was, he was a lot of fun. Um, our friend Cheryl Kaiser did a program on Moxie Mamas at the Catlin House one year talking about um, powerful women in history. Our You Live Here, You Should Know This local history game show continues. Uh, this year was online for the first time um, after having been in person for 10 years. Uh, we work with students from Riverside and, Riverside and Valley View School Districts to come up with questions on local history. Um, and then we embarrass our friends by asking questions that they sometimes don't know. Um, but it's a great deal of fun. Uh, we've also had authors come in and speak about their books. Um, Barbara Taylor was there twice. Um, for her series, um, I think the second, this All Waiting Is Long is her second book, I believe. Um, one of the newer exhibits that we had that our curator Ella put in, um, in the last year or so, um, we kind of revamped our, our children's toy area on the second floor in the Catlin House. Uh, we had received a 1905 child's tricycle and also um, the swan rocker that you see in that photo. And some things that we get in are just too cool to put away. Um, so we find a way to incorporate them into the house immediately, um, which kind of spurred our, our revamp of the, the children's toy area that we have on the second floor. Um, eventually, when the house reopens, possibly in like October, um, you'll be able to come in and see them. Um, then desperate times call for desperate measures as we move into these interesting times that we're still in. Um, we've started doing these Zoom programs. Um, we've been doing them since the beginning of April. Um, presentations ourselves and then from guest presenters about all kinds of local history topics, um, presenters past and present. Um, we had a Civil War general, we had a visit from Louise and May Alcott. Um, our friend George Gula talked about trolleys. Um, he'll be joining us again next week um, to talk more about the Laurel Line. Um, and they're, they're a good way to kind of reach a, a different audience and bring some of our, our programming forward. Um, the videos are posted on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page. And so far in the last two months or so, um, we've had more than a thousand people um, either seeing them in person or tuning in, tuning in afterward to watch the, the videos. On Facebook, we've been posting a daily diversion um, most days um, with some of our historic photos and newspaper articles and objects from our collection. Just kind of to pull, pull things out there that people don't always see. Uh, we have a, a roster of favorite photos that we usually rely on. Um, we like to try and pull out some things that others may not have seen quite as often. Um, photos that, that we love for a variety of reasons. Um, postcard, one on the left is a, a color postcard image um, of the, the, Woolworth, the Woolworth Estate um, at Lily Lake. On the right is Bowers Band marching down Lackawanna Avenue or Washington Avenue. Uh, one of the first things that we started to do during the coronavirus scare um, was to start a, a, a digital archive online. Um, we like to talk about history happening every day and how we can record it. Um, this was a, a project that we, we borrowed from a friend of ours um, who's doing it at, I believe it was the University of Kentucky. Um, and we're collecting people's reminiscences, reminiscences um, as they happen. So we have an, an online survey set up, um, one for adults and one for students to answer you know, basic, simple questions about how you heard about it, what your, re what your response was, um, how your life is different today, to kind of keep track of how everyday life actually is. Um, we noticed when we were doing the Spanish flu research in, 19, in 2018, um, there's a lot of newspaper articles, but it's very hard to gauge 
the everyday reaction of what it's kind of what it's really like. Um, this was a way to kind of help with that. Um, part of it also, we have a, a space to allow people to upload um, if they have you know handwritten letters or journals um, or any other social media posts that they wanted to, to share. Um, our curator Ella has taken it on herself um, to start saving cartoons. Um, so they're a, a little more fun way to tell the story. Um, in the center is one of the ones that she had submitted, um, just a centipede washing his hands. We also posted our The Story of Scranton local history curriculum online. Uh, when the, the schools were closed in March, um, we tried to find a way to reach out to, to students, to give them a chance to maybe do something, something a little different, something that their, their parents may, um, may be interested in as well. We posted the curriculum guide on our website as well as a, a short list of discussion questions and activities, um, things that people could do from their homes to learn a little bit more about, um, about the history of Scranton in the area. Um, as Mary Ann mentioned before, our, our ghostly gallery. Uh, this is one of our, one of our favorite things. Um, we said they had the idea that when the Catlin House was closed, the portraits were in the house by themselves um, and they got bored and rowdy and they wanted to introduce themselves to people. So um, our very clever coworker Olivia came up with a way to animate some of these um, some of these portraits, and they'll tell you their their life stories. Um, Marianne, can I swap to you if you have one ready to go? Hello, and welcome to my home. My name is George Henry Catlin, and I've really been missing all of our visitors. So I've decided to hop on one of these newfangled computing machines so that I could reach out and let you know that we're all still hanging around and would like very much to share our stories with you. I was born in 1845 in Shoreham, Vermont, and moved to Scranton in 1870 with my wife, Mary Archbold. You may know her father, James. He's a very important person with a town named after him. No? Well... He's around here somewhere, and I'm sure he would like to tell you about it himself sometime. I started my career as a lawyer, then moved into banking as a co-founder of the Third National Bank in 1872. Sadly, my wife Mary died in 1902, and my second wife Helen and I did quite a bit of traveling before returning to Scranton. I built this house for her in 1912. As a student of history myself, I was the first life member of the Lackawanna Historical Society, and in my will, I donated my home to the society to serve as a cultural center and museum, since they had no fixed location or space in which to store their many collections. Perhaps you would like to continue my legacy and donate to the society as well. I certainly do hope so. Thank you for that lovely commercial, George. Uh, <laughs> that was that was one of our one of our more fun projects that we've that we've come up with. Um, I see they are on our website. Um, George Catlin, James Archibald, James's wife Sarah are there. Um, William Henry is posted as well, um, and George Scranton are there. We're working to put some more up. Um, we have voices recorded. We're just not quite. We don't have all the animation done. Um, so, but if you go to our website, there is a link to them. Um, they're a, they're a fun way to kind of kind of move forward as well with what we're what we're doing. Um, the quarantine has kind of pushed us I think out of the box and we think we've done it pretty well. Um, but thank you. <laughs> the very important staff of the Lagwana Historical Society. Um, thank you for for all of your all of your support um, for helping us make our programming successful as we keep trying to reinvent it as we're going on. Um, and as Marianne mentioned today is NEPA Gives Day for the um, benefit for the Lackawanna Historical Society. Um, there is a link on our Facebook page and on our website as well um, for donations. Um, we would appreciate your support. Well, again, thank you everybody for, for tuning in. Um, we're, we're glad you, we're glad, we're glad to see you every, every week. Um, next week we'll be doing this again um, Friday at two o'clock. Um, my friend George Bull will be talking about the Laurel Live. So um, have, a, have a lovely weekend everybody um, and remember the Historical Society for NEPA Gives Day. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Wash your hands. <laughs>